Okay, our next speaker is Professor Dr. Dennis Kochman from EATH Zugig. Nuestro siguiente expositor es el, el profesor, el Dr. Dennis Kochman del ETH Zurich. He graduated from Ruhr University Bochum with a diploma in mechanical engineering applied mechanics in 2006. Él obtuvo el grado de un diploma en ingeniería mecánica y mecánica aplicada el año 2006. Then, as a Fulbright Fellow, he moved to the U.S., obtaining a master's degree in engineering mechanics. Después de eso, mediante una beca Fulbright, se fue a Estados Unidos y obtuvo un magíster en, eh, en ingeniería mecánica. Back in Germany, Dr. Kochmann earned an engineering doctorate from Ruhr University Bochum in 2009. Luego de eso, él volvió a Alemania y obtuvo un doctorado en ingeniería de la Ruhr University Bochum el año 2009. After that, he went back to the U.S. as a postdoctoral associate in the Department of Engineering Physics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison before moving to the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, as a postdoctoral scholar in aerospace in 2010. Después de eso, él volvió a Estados Unidos como un alumno de postdoctorado al Departamento de Ingeniería eh, Física en la Universidad de Wisconsin-Madison para posteriormente irse al California Institute of Technology, al Caltech, como un alumno eh, postdoctoral en el área aeroespacial el año 2010. He joined the faculty of Caltech's Aerospace Department in the Division of Engineering and Applied Science as assistant professor of aerospace in 2011 and became professor of aerospace in 2016. Luego se unió al, al área académica del Caltech, en la División de Ingeniería y Ciencia Aplicada, como un profesor asistente de Ingeniería Aeroespacial en el año 2011, y luego se volvió eh, profesor del área, profesor titular en el año 2016. He is currently the director of the Kochmann Group at ETH Zugis, Zugis, Switzerland, from 2017. Él en la actualidad es el director del Kochmann Research Group en el ETH Zugis, en Suiza, desde el año 2017. His research focuses on combining theoretical, computational, and experimental methods of solid mechanics to study the link between microstructure and microscopic properties of different materials. Su investigación se centra en combinar la teoría, la los métodos experimentales y computacionales de la mecánica de sólidos para estudiar el enlace que existe entre las microestructuras y las propiedades macroscópicas de diferentes materiales. Well, this is a very, very brief introduction to Dr. Kochman, because, because if I read the entire CV, we will run out of time. So, yeah, Professor Kochman is not to present anymore. <laughs> it's, it's an honor to have you here, please. Of course, thanks very much for the kind of introduction. Thank you to everyone for, for listening. Um, in these crazy times, the virtual meetings are becoming more and more usual, and so I was delighted when the invitation came to, to virtually present, uh, which of course I can easily do from my living room and hopefully reach some of you and convince you that mechanics of materials is actually an interesting topic. Uh, I have to apologize that even though I spent many years in California, my Spanish is horrible, hablo pero solo un poquito, and that's why I have to uh, stick to English with my presentation. Probably also, better, uh, better than my Spanish, so... <laughs> That, well, my English, sorry. Uh, another disclaimer, I try to keep this talk deliberately at a relatively high level, showing very few equations, uh, a lot of examples. So I apologize to the experts in advance that it's going to be rather simple. And I also, of course, have to show some of the details. So I apologize to those not in the area because some things might be fast. But let's start slowly and get into what I would like to talk about. I'm just showing you a few high level pictures of what the topic is, and then we'll dive right into it. Uh, the, the theme is when structures become materials, or I shall say metamaterials. This is a philosophical view on materials, and of course we know this very well. If we look at the early ages of mankind, how they, they were known, they were known by materials. Right? It's the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the 20th century is often called the Digital Age, uh, because uh, of course we all know that our cell phones and computers wouldn't work without germanium, silicium, and so forth. Um, but the key point here is that if you look at what made mankind advance to the next step, it was not philosophy or languages or, or, or uh, great uh, uh, scientific inventions, but in many cases, these were materials that led us to advance to the next step. And of course, one may, may, may wonder what comes next. Uh, right now, we might be, some say, in the era, in the, uh, era of 3D printing. Um, but the main point is that materials throughout all these ages uh, have uh, had a tremendous impact and that's one of the reasons why this is a very old discipline and why we're still interested in advancing materials and going the next step always keeping 
the question in mind, what comes next? What can we do better? One of the key challenges of materials is that they are not easy. They're not easy to model, to understand, to make. And I'm going to visualize this just by this, uh, this animation here, which shows ETH, our main building, which has a cupola on top that's made out of metal. And if you zoom into this one, then of course, what's underneath the shiny surface is a lot of structure. If you zoom in with a microscope, what you'll find is, as we all know, in metals, we have grains of different orientations, and they make up the complicated mesoscale. If you zoom in even further, you end up on the level of individual defects. There are dislocations, entanglements, like these ones that we're seeing here. And of course, if you zoom in even further, this is with high resolution TEM, then you're at the level of individual atoms. And you could keep even going to the more fundamental particles of quantum mechanics below. And the real problem with materials is that we need to bridge across this gap. If we look at time scales and length scales involved, many of the mechanisms we just showed at the atomic scale, they live on the order of sub-nanometers and angstroms and at time scales on the order of femtoseconds, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So what gives rise to specific material behavior starts down here, but of course, ultimately as engineers, we want to be here. This is where we design our our tools, our problems, our components, and the question is how do you bridge this gap? And in bridging this gap, of course, what we, what we do, and in particular what we do, and I really mean we, uh, my group among others, is to use modeling and simulations. And modeling and simulations, of course, can try to bridge from atoms to the mesoscale to the macro scale, where ultimately we're using FEM and the typical finite element tools, but we have to go across many, many scales. And the challenges that we typically run into, on the one hand of the follow-up problem, this is as old as mankind. The question is, if you hand me a material, what are its properties? And can I potentially predict the properties if I understand what the features are at the small scales? So this is the follow-up problem. What I would say is even harder is the inverse problem. The question is, if you want a perfect material, let's say you have an application and you want a material that is light, strong, stiff, uh, permeable to water, has a high heat resistivity, what not. What we oftentimes do as engineers is we go to books and we look into tables. But what we really want is to solve the inverse problem. How do I make a material that has exactly these properties? And these are the, the key challenges that we often run into as engineers when it comes to materials. Now, this is where metamaterials enter the picture. And I'd like to motivate this by, again, looking at classical materials. If this thing in the middle, which is schematically shown here, were a classical, was a classical material, when we zoom in, we see microstructure. We see the types of pictures I was just showing. Uh, we see grain structures, we see dislocations and defects, we see atoms ultimately. And of course, the first challenge is how do we predictively model this behavior? How do I go from atoms to defects to microstructures to the macroscale properties? And we need predictive models that tell us how do we actually affect the properties when we change things at the lower scales? The second challenge that I haven't even talked about is how do we manipulate these materials? What I mean by this is imagine that someone tells you if you replace exactly these three atoms by something else, you could make the perfect material. That knowledge would probably not be very helpful because there simply is no way today that we can go in and replace and modify individual atoms. We have processing techniques that help us here, of course, but there simply is no way to modify the atomic structure to the level that we would need, even if we had all the knowledge in the world about predictive modeling these techniques. And this is where matter materials enter. Matter comes from Greek, it means beyond, so we're literally trying to go beyond materials. And the idea is very simple. You scratch all this, you replace it, and you replace it by not atoms, not defects, but by structure. So if you zoom into those at the lower scale, we will find structure. You will find trusses, plates, shells, but something regular that we understand very well. There's a reason why our undergraduate mechanics studies, we teach everyone how trusses and bars and frames behave, but we don't necessarily teach atomistics and quantum mechanics to our first year students. It is because the principles here are so much easier than they are over there. So if we can make properties based on structure, it would actually help us a lot because the principles here are so much easier than they are when we try to manipulate individual atoms. Of course, we're not the first to do this kind of thing. Nature, is usually, is, uh, as usual, is much smarter than us. Um, this is a picture of uh, human bone. And if you look at bone, it's a very typical structure that looks similar to the one I had before. It's not necessarily periodic, but it's also a cellular structure. And of course, human bone derives its properties from this specific structure. 
Even more so, if you look at real bone, what you will find is that nature is much smarter than that. Within any bone, they may even change the microstructure from one point to another to accommodate the loads that you have to carry to accommodate the properties you would like to optimize. And so the challenges that I would like to highlight here, and this is mainly what I'll talk about, is we need predictive models that take us from the small scales to the large scales. We need ways to manipulate material behavior to make perfect materials. And in the end, we also need to figure out how to change material properties from point to point and how to do the inverse design. Even if you know the perfect properties, how do you make that material? And this is really where metamaterials are a big step because they derive their properties not from complicated atoms and all these kind of things. Of course, ultimately they are made of a base material, but the real properties come from structure and they come from architecture. So just quickly, what do I mean by this? Uh, let's look at this picture over here, which shows a periodic truss. It's made of many truss members. There's a unit cell, and this is periodically tessellated, which gives rise to the overall structure. You know, imagine that you're tessellating millions of these unit cells. You're going to end up with what we call a metamaterial. It's still made of some base material. You can make this out of polymer or ceramic or something else. And that base material has properties. It has density, a modulus, a, a yield strength, and so forth. But these are only part of the story. Because whenever I now talk about effective material properties, I will no longer talk about the base material properties, but I will talk about what happens if you take this big cube of assembled unit cells and you, for example, compress it. What is really the stiffness that you measure? It's not the one of the base material, but it is something that depends on the base material and on the architecture. And by architecture, I mean the topology, how many beams do meet at each point, do I use triangles or squares or hexagon or something more complicated, and the geometry, what is the cross section, how do I make the meet and so forth. This is the architecture and the key point is that if you select the base material and the architecture, you can get a tremendous wealth of mechanical properties that you could be interested in. And just as a quick teaser, this is really a cartoon, a simulation, but what you see here are two trusses. Both have exactly the same density, the same mass. But when you contract them here under an indenter, what you see is they behave completely differently. If you look at the final configuration, the right deforms a lot, nonlinearly, the, the left one is much stiffer. And the real reason is that even though they have the same mass, after all, the distribution is very different. And the unit cells are shown here. That's a very simple example where architecture gives you different properties. And I guess we all understand that different architectures can give rise to different properties. So this is just a cartoon. How do you actually make those guys? This is where experimentalists come in. And I'm going to show a few pictures from uh, my friend and colleague, Julia Greer at Caltech, who is an expert in nanoscale fabrication. This is a truss. It looks almost like the one I was showing you previously. But the thing to note is the scale bar down here, if you can see it. This is about 40 microns, meaning this entire thing is maybe 150 microns in size. These trusses are tiny. If you don't believe me, this is a human hair on the same scale. So this fits roughly into the diameter of a human hair. It's absolutely tiny. And the key point is, if you can make the trusses so small, and you make millions of those, the naked eye, by the end of the day, will not even be able to see the trusses it will look to us like a material, except that the properties no longer come from assembling atoms, but they come from assembling struts, assembling bars and beams, and we have the power to do that. So how does this work? Uh, let me show how Julia's team has pioneered this. It's actually a relatively simple process. First, what they do is they print a polymeric skeleton. There's a method called two-photon lithography, where essentially you run with a laser through a liquid polymer resin and you solidify wherever you focus the laser, you can make a polymer skeleton which looks like this. Once you have it, you can actually coat it from the outside, for example, with a metal or a ceramic that's indicated by the yellow layer here. Then what you could do, you could stop there, of course, if you want a polymer uh, truss, that's it. If you want a polymer coated with a layer, that's it. But what they do on top of this is you can actually open the sides with a focused ion beam and you can use plasma to etch out the polymer that you originally printed. And what you're left with in the end are these very hollow shell tubes. So imagine that these are tubes with a very hollow thickness on the order of maybe a bunch of nanometers. What this means is this is in the end extremely light. It's 99.999% air. It has extremely low density. 
but the properties may still be interesting and they depend on architecture and base material. And then of course you can go and you can test those. You can put them under an indenter, for example, measure the stress strain behavior. And then the engineers are back in business because then we can talk about modulus and yield strength and all these kind of things. Why do we do this? Well, because there are things like that. I'm sure uh, some of you or many have seen these kind of Ashby charts. The idea is you take all the materials that we have and you plot, for example, their stiffness, the Young's modulus versus their mass density or their strength versus the density. And what you will find is that most materials we have fall almost perfectly onto this diagonal over here, which means the heavier the material, the stiffer it is. Foams are down here, polymers and rubbers are here in the middle, ceramics and metals are up here. And the same is pretty much uh, shown uh, for strength as well. There are some upper limits. We cannot just do anything. Uh, for example, uh, if you take the stiffest material on earth, diamond, and you remove material from it, so you make it hollow, you cannot keep the same stiffness while removing more and more material. There's a natural law that tells us it doesn't work. There's the so-called fault bound, which means there is an upper bound to what we can achieve. But this also shows us that there is plenty of white space in this plot. All these regions here, which would be materials that are very light and very stiff, they just haven't been discovered yet. We don't have anything that sits in this region. And there are many applications from biomedical uh, to uh, packaging, to insulation and protection, to whatnot, uh, especially in uh, aviation aerospace, you want materials that are light, but that provide high stiffness and high strength. And these are some of the white spaces, especially here and here, that one that loves to dive into. Of course, there's also plenty of white space down here, but these are materials that are extremely heavy and have very poor stiffness and strength. That's something that we normally don't care about that there's a wide space of them here and there that we're interested in. And what I want to talk about today in the next, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes or something like this is metamaterials that achieve certain properties found elsewhere. I'm going to talk about stiff ones. And here the idea is to understand the stiffness, not tuning atoms, but structures. Strong ones, where the idea is how can we improve the strength and resilience not by playing with dislocations and atoms, but by playing with structure. And adaptive ones. This one is actually linked to phase transformations in solids, but the idea is how can we make materials that actually reconfigure and change shape uh, uh, at will. So these are the three examples I'd like to talk about, each one of them in a bit more detail. Before I do this, I have one slide on a more technical note, uh, more for experts. What's the technique behind predicting most of this? That's the concept known as homogenization. And the idea is relatively simple, uh, even though it doesn't look like this. Let's say this is a macroscopic body that you would like to use in your engineering analysis. And you would, you would like to know what its properties are. At every point of this body, there is an underlying microstructure. So if you zoom in carefully, for a real material, you would see atoms. For a material, you would see structure. Here, we want to solve our classical engineering equations. For example, some of all forces is zero, linear momentum balance, angular momentum balance, all these kind of things. And we need a constitutive law. And what one normally does in homogenization is one bypasses the constitutive law. We don't say that the Young's modulus is this or the material behavior is this and this. What we do is we take information from here, for example, displacements, strains, higher gradients. We pass them down to the unit cell. We then solve the unit cell problem which means we take the unit cell, we deform it in some sense, according to whatever we're getting down from the macro scale. We're then solving a problem down here, trying to figure out how the atoms rearrange or how the trusses rearrange for the given strains on average that we're getting from the macro scale. Then we're computing energetics, stresses, and so forth down here, and we're passing this back. The so-called macro to micro transition or homogenization is the idea of how we extract effective properties. And this can be done for materials, but it can also be done for metamaterials. You hand me a strain tensor, I apply an average to a unit cell, I see what the unit cell does, I compute the energy of the unit cell, I compute the average stress, and I hand to you back a stress. And that way I've constructed a constitutive material model without uh, postulating it or basically doing it on the fly. What this means in practice is, of course, we can do this for more complicated scenarios, not just uh, stiffness in these things. But what you see here on the left is uh, an example of a discrete truss. Truss unit cells periodically put together, and these are about 9 million truss members. One of the reasons we do homogenization is that imagine that you now have to solve this with FEA. 
I mean, sure, you can do it. But if you solve this using our code, which may not be the best in the world, but it took us about eight hours of simulation time to take this cube and deform it. We're applying very large torsion to see how, what happens if you go into a nonlinear regime. But simply the fact that you have 9 million trust members and many, many more degrees of freedom means this is darn expensive. If you can replace this by a homogenized effective continuum as shown on the right, we can simulate the effective behavior because we have understood how the structure behaves. Here, we just do classical, more or less classical FEA, but we have obtained information about the constitutive model from the lower scale. And then you can run in 20 minutes of simulation time on a laptop, what you otherwise do in eight hours uh, on larger machines. But the idea is, forget about the microstructure for a second, try to work at the large scale with classical FEA and so forth, but use the material model whose information is obtained from the lower scales over here. That's the, the key idea. And I, I don't want to go too much into detail because I'm sure I would bore you with the details. So let me show you a quick uh, survey of what you can do. And these are some more interesting examples from practice. What you see here on the right are four different examples of trust lattices. They're called octet, cube octahedron, kagomi, tetrakai. They have fancy names, uh, but these are all just different names for what the architecture looks like. And there are two interesting things here. The first one is that you can really make these structures with tremendous precision, at least Julia's group can. Um, just for comparison, what you see on the left is the cat image. What you see on the right for each of these is the SEM image. There's hardly any difference. You can make them almost perfectly. If you now take these materials and you measure the Young's modulus, for example, you take them, you compress them vertically, and you just measure the force versus displacement curve, and from this extract the modulus, you can plot them. And you can plot them, again, with density versus Young's modulus versus yield strength. And you again see this typical behavior of the straight line that we saw previously. The lighter you make them, the lower uh, strength and modulus you get. But it's still an interesting question as to how does this compare to existing materials. Of course, you can also do this at larger scales. If you use your most favorite 3D printer, you can make them, for example, out of polymer or metal. You can still use the different unit cells and verify the properties. One thing we learned early on is that when you work at small scales, things are different. Um, and I'm going to show you one of the lessons that we learned. What I'm showing you here are three different examples. Each of them has the same architecture, which is shown schematically up here. I'm showing you stiffness versus density. In this case, the truss is a polymer beam truss. And they're, so they're monolithic solid uh, polymer beams. Here, we coated the beams with uh, alumina, which is a ceramic. And here, we etched out the polymer, so you only see the hollow ceramic beams. And in each of the cases, Julia's team measured in experiments, these are the colored red-blue points, the stiffness as a function of density. You can see points here, points there, points there. We then try to simply simulate the stiffness. It should be an easy job for an engineer to put together a few beams and figure out what the effective stiffness is. But it turns out that what's shown by the red arrows here is that while we had pretty good agreement for the solid polymer ones, for the composite ones, we were off by something on the order of 30%. And for the hollow ones, we were off by even 68%. Then, of course, the typical ping pong starts. We go to the experimentalists and say, hey, you're doing something wrong. And they come to us and they say, no, 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 the model must be wrong. And so we have to figure out what was wrong. And small is different. Why am I saying this? If you print things at these small scales, imperfections can be tremendous. What I'm showing you here on the left is, of course, an extreme case that you would never find in, in the structures in the end that we produced or that Julia team produced. But if you print something at the nanoscale, then if you even just walk past the machine or you talk in the same room, these vibrations are sufficient to cause vibrations of the machine, of the structure. And what you see here are undulations in the beams that stem from this kind of behavior. Of course, if this vibration undulation is on the order of nanometers, you will never see it when you print a large structure. But when you print the structure at the nanometer scale, going up by 10, 20 nanometers actually matters a lot. And so once we knew this, we actually measured the wavelength and the amplitude and so forth, and we perform FE simulations with waviness, with wavy struts. And it turns out the FE predictions told us that with the coding, we should actually go down by 32%. In the experiments, we were off by 30.2%.
When we rerun the simulations for hollow ceramics, it turned out that we brought the stiffness down by 70%. In experiments, we were off by 68.5%. So in the end, it actually matched perfectly. But what we learned is we actually have to understand that at small scales, things may be different, and these imperfections must be taken into account. But once you do this, you can make beautiful structures. And here's just one example of hierarchical beams, where you have beams made out of beams made out of beams. These are extremely lightweight. And again, you can tune the properties that we like. So how are we doing in terms of the maps I was showing you earlier on? These are the two pictures of uh, stiffness and strength versus density I showed you. If you take each of these lines, let's say the red one for the ceramic hollow ones, uh, the bulk ceramic ones, Oh, no, sorry. These are, the, these are the ceramic trusses. And this point up here is basically the plain bulk ceramic. So the ceramic itself has a density and the modulus. When you remove material, you go down this line. If I take this red line and I plot it over here, again, starting with the alumina up here, we actually follow a line like this. And so what it means is you can actually probe this white space up here. And you can do so very well by going lower and lower in density with these trusses. The polymeric ones are here, they fall in the ballpark of where you would find foams, but still it kind of shows that you can probe the white space quite efficiently and you can make a variety of materials. As you can see here, you spend several orders of magnitude and density with these structures and this can relatively easily be done. Just as a quick teaser, of course, what I showed you were periodic trusses. Uh, one of the things that we're currently working on is functionally graded trusses. Imagine that you make these structures where you don't use the same unit cell everywhere, but you change the unit cell, for example, from hexagon to this fishbone one back to hexagon. And if you do this and you deform the structures, of course, you're going to get very different behavior in the different regions. These are simulations only. Um, but you can very easily imagine that with this, you can also have structures that have different properties and different behavior in different regions as you need them. There are many applications from uh, personal protection to bike helmets to shoe insoles and so forth, but this is of great interest. Okay, so I've been talking a lot about trusses and stiffness and so forth. I want to spend a couple of minutes on strong ones. Uh, and strength is not necessarily a strength, uh, it's a game of words of trusses for the following reason. Every truss has junctions where the trusses meet. And every engineer knows that if you now load this thing, then at these sharp corners here, you're going to have stress concentrations. There's a sharp notch, there's a stress concentration. So if you now load this thing, what's going to happen is they are most likely going to fail at the junctions. And this is also what you see in experiments. You see these guys cracking over and over. And so if you keep loading these struts, even with low uh, wall thicknesses where you can get interesting behavior, at some point they're all going to fail simply because you're causing fracture and behavior that uh, is indicative of failure at the nodes and the junctions. By the way, the same applies to plates. Uh, my colleague here at ETH, Dirk Moore, has pioneered a lot of these plate-like uh, metamaterials that can reach even higher stiffness than struts. But again, at every point where two plates meet, you're going to have a stress concentration, and that means you're going to have failure signs. So what we want to do is go beyond this and try to do something else. Try to come up with a structure that's completely smooth. And the idea is borrowed from physics. If you take a mixture of two materials and you let them demix, it's known as spinodal decomposition, what happens then is you get interesting structures. Think of putting water and oil together, you're shaking the system and then you let it sit and let go. If you just wait long enough, what you see is that water and oil are going to separate again. The same thing happens if, for example, you put silver and gold together. These two have a miscibility gap. And so if you just let them sit, what happens is they separate. And this was known or has been known for a long time. If you then, for example, take this gold-silver mixture, you let them separate, and you take out the silver, what you're left with are these gold foams. They're really nanopores foams at small scales. But one of the features you can already see is that these are very, very smooth. And there's a reason for that. So if you want to quickly think about the theory behind it, you can model this with a relatively simple phase field model. You have a cube, you put in two materials, let's say phi equals one indicates the red material, phi equals blue indicates the blue material. So it's a phase field and anything between zero and one indicates an interface. You can set up the energy of this thing. The energy uh, would be 
This over here is known as Ginzburg-Landau energy. This basically has two minima at phi equals zero and one. It just wants the structure to be either solid or uh, either one or zero and nothing else. Then there's interface energy. And this interface energy here is essential because it drives the system to minimize interface energy. And the worst thing you can do is to have a sharp kink because in this case, your gradient of gamma is extremely high. So this term drives smooth interfaces. If you want to simulate the evolution, uh, one usually solves the kahn hilliard equation. And here's one example. You start from random, you let it sit. And what you get by the end of the day are these structures that have smooth interfaces and that have separated into two. If you now think about, let's say these are two materials, let's say I remove the blue face, like in the nanoporous foam. I'm then going to coat the red face with a material. And I'm then going to remove also the red face. I guess you can see where I'm going. You will end up with these very thin shells, which are basically only the interfaces between the original faces. But if this is the only thing left, you end up with a cell structure again, which is very thin, uh, very lightweight, but it doesn't have any sharp kinks or corners anymore. You can do even more, um, quick escape into theory, this M, which appears in the evolution equation, is a mobility. What it means essentially is that if you look at the diffusion, and diffusion is one of the driving forces behind what happens here, this can actually be anisotropic, meaning you might see this phase separation faster in some directions than in others. And if this happens, the structures are not completely random, but they seem to have some structure to them. And there's old theory that goes back to Kahn in the 60s, which shows that the solution to this evolution problem that I'm trying to solve here actually has an analytical form, it has an analytical solution given in terms of what's known as a Gaussian random field. So if I write phi of this type, where n over here are some wave vectors sampled randomly from the unit sphere, and gamma are some random numbers, phase shifts from zero to two pi, I can use this to actually describe the solution uh, of the problem. These are randomly sampled in general, but now we can play a trick. Um, and if you're not familiar with the theory, just bear with me for one second. Uh, hopefully it'll, it'll become clear. What we do is, if these n vectors are completely random, pointing in any direction, then you end up with a random isotropic foam, essentially. But if you pick these n vectors to point only in specific directions, what happens is that the material is going to align in such a fashion that all the interfaces that you see here want to be perpendicular to n. So if I pick my n vectors to point only up and down, then you would only see horizontal plates and nothing else. If I allow this n vector to vary inside this yellow cone, that means my n vector, my surface normal, can be anywhere in this cone, but cannot be anywhere else. And by doing this, I actually have a description of how I can make different structures. If these n vectors lie only up or down, or in these green cones shown up here, you basically get plates because material wants to align perpendicular to these n vectors. If I open up this cone, that's the second example here, you're going to see more faces that point in different directions, but still a bit layer. When you remove any up or down n vectors and you only have them in the plane, what happens is you get these columns because now the surface wants to be perpendicular to the ends in the yellow and blue columns. And you can really play with these angles and you can use them to parametrize all kinds of architectures that you might be interested in. And so these cone angles can now be used as design parameters. If I specify the opening angle of this green cone, of the yellow cone and of the bleak, uh, blue cone, sorry, then this parameterizes explains what the structure looks like. It's not really a spanodal decomposition anymore because I've played with the solution. It's not actually an exact solution of the original problem. So we like to not call this spinodal decomposition anymore, but we call these spinodoid structures uh, because they mimic the spinodal ones, but they're not exactly the same. So from theory to practice, here are a couple of examples. Carlos Portella at Caltech and Julia's group printed those. Um, these are some of the cubes that are at very small scales. Scale bar is two millimeters. If you zoom in, you see features coming up. And by the end of the day, we use exactly the same approach. These are 3D printed coated, and then the polymer is etched out. So what you're left with are these thin shell uh, cellular solids. And this is uh, an image where the electron beam can even go through the shells. The shell thickness is on the order of maybe 20 nanometers, and you can even look through individual shells, so thin are these structures. And again, it's on the order of 150 microns. The key feature here is that 
if you again look at stress distributions and you compare this guy to a, a truss, there is no sharp junction or corner anymore. So when you compress this and you look at stresses, you will not find any sides of such high stress concentrations. The consequence is a very nice one. What I'm showing you here is a movie, uh, I mean, it's an experimental image from an indenter. On the left, you see one of these structures with these thin shells, and we're going to compress this from the bottom, from the top. And on the right, we're recording stress versus strain. And I'm just gonna play this and let you watch. And what you see is that we're compressing this thing to 30% compression. Uh, imagine doing this with your ceramic vase at home. This is a ceramic material. Um, even you know, 0.1% usually leads to brittle shattering of any ceramic material. Here, we can load this thing to 30% and we can do so repeatedly. And there's some variation, of course, from cycle to cycle, but you don't see any cracking. You don't see significant fracture. And the reason is twofold. On the one hand, it's the principle of architecture again. We made sure that there are no stress concentration sites where they could initiate failure. And second, once the shells are so thin, this is on the order of 20 nanometers, there's a material size effect kicking in because at these very small scales, statistically speaking, there's hardly any defect anymore, hardly any uh, cracks, dislocations, and so forth. And because of this, there's a material strengthening effect too. And so this is another example where architecture in these metamaterials really led to behavior you would not expect in the first place. As I mentioned, you can make them anisotropic. And there's different structures that can be you know, almost pancakey, very stiff in one direction and uh, soft in others. Uh, these figures here are elastic surfaces, if that means something, um, which means it shows the young small just in different directions and you can see strong variation. The nice thing, and this is really ongoing work, is that you don't really have to print these structures, but in principle, they emerge naturally from self-assembly. All you need is to have some kind of polymer emulsion where the two faces separate. You need to code one and etch them out. This is exactly what Carlos Portella and, and colleagues at Caltech are, are, are still trying. And you can actually make these structures, but not at you know 150 micron size, but you can make pucks on the size of centimeters that have these nanometer and micrometer scale features. And this is a way to make them in a scalable fashion, not tiny cubes, but large objects that still have the features you want. Um, now I wanna spend five minutes or so on the inverse design problem, um, because this is really a key challenge. And everybody here, of course, I don't know about you, but here people are crazy about artificial intelligence, machine learning and so forth. So I'm gonna give you an example of how it applies here. What we can easily do is go from architecture to properties. This is material characterization. What we want to do is the inverse design. You want properties, how do you make them? In principle, we have the tools for that. So we could generate many structures, measure their elastic stiffness, and use this as our training data that we use to feed some neural network. So that in the future, if someone comes to us and says, we want a certain stiffness distribution, how does the structure have to look? This is what the neural network has to answer. It's not that easy, um, and I'm gonna show you in a second why. So even though we have this large training data set of architectures, topology, linked to a particular stiffness, if someone comes with a stiffness Y and says, you know, how does the structure look? What we want is we want to train some neural network, which in the end tells us, yes, use this topology and it's gonna have that stiffness. It, it looks easy, and the design parameters in our case could be, for example, these cone op opening angles that we introduced earlier. The problem is that the, the problem, the inverse problem is inherently ill-posed because there are many different architectures that actually have the same stiffness. And so if you try to train this classically, you run into an issue because if I give you an isotropic stiffness, there may be 5,000 different architectures in your training data set that exactly meet the purpose, meet the, the requirement of your query, but which one do you choose? One of them, all of them? The problem is ill-posed when you're trying to train this neural network, it's just not gonna work. So our idea was very simple and is the following. We never compare topologies. What we do is if you hand me a queried stiffness, I would try to predict the topology. I would then compute via homogenization its stiffness and would compare the two stiffnesses. And if they are the same, then I basically have found what you want. I haven't found the exact topology that may be in the training data set associated with the stiffness, but I have found a topology that gives you exactly the stiffness that you want. And so what we say is let's try to minimize the distance between these two. 
There's one catch in there. This homogenization is very expensive because you have to perform abacus or, or FEM simulations all the time. So we replace this by a second neural network that is pre-trained. And this is the easy one. Going from topology to stiffness is a unique map that we can easily train. It's fast and cheap. And then we have two neural networks, which are more or less uh, working together to give us what we want. And this works beautifully. It's well posed, it's relatively efficient, and the training data set doesn't even have to be gigantic. We just published it last week, if you're interested. Um, I'm going to give you one example where this might be of interest in applications. Let's say that you hand me an elastic stiffness. And I, I'm going to cut these elastic surfaces in three directions, so I'm getting uh, the projections here. First, second, and third. If you hand me these elastic surfaces, for example, the red one or the black ones or corrected ones, and you want a structure that meets exactly these stiffness values, what we would do is we crank it through the neural network or the two, and our inverse neural network would give us a structure which has certain cone angles. You can see it's a bit columnar. Uh, surfaces are oriented in these directions. It has a certain density of 34% in this case. And if you compare the input to the output, in principle, we should be comparing blue and black for technical reasons. They match pretty much perfectly. Not perfect, but close to that. Why would we care about this? Well, these input elastic surfaces are actually not just random guesses. They were measured elastic surfaces from bovine femoral bone. So researchers went and measured what the elastic stiffness of bone is in the three different directions. And they also measured the relative density. Our network didn't know anything about bone. Right? It started with these architectures that we played with. We simply fed into it the stiffness of bone. And what comes out is a structure which has almost the same density as the bone. It has pretty much the same elastic uh, properties as the bone. And it even looks to some extent like the bone. You see these columnar features come out. And this belief could be a very nice stepping stone for artificial bone and implants, where if you know what exactly the effective stiffness is. And of course, one can play the game also beyond stiffness. We're currently working on large deformation strength and so forth. We can find a structure which is not the same, but which gives you, which gives you pretty much the same properties. What's very neat, I don't have time for this, is you can also grade these. So if you want different structures and different properties in one end and the other, there's a way to very smoothly go from one to another, also go in size from one end to another. And this is of great interest if you have bone where you want different properties at different points. Okay, last few minutes, I'm gonna do this quickly, but I wanted to show you also one example of adaptive ones. Um, so far, we've seen static, I wanna say, uh, metamaterials. You make them, you can test them, but they have one configuration and one set of properties. What you might be sometimes interested in are adaptive ones, uh, architectures that change their shape change the configuration, the properties by the push of a button. And this is what I mean by adaptive ones. And the principle is relatively simple. And this year is joint work with Katya Bertoli and their team at Harvard, um, where what we exploit is what people nowadays use a lot in the area of soft robotics, use architectures that have more than one stable configuration. What you see here is a sheet that was made by laser cutting. You take a solid sheet and you basically just make holes into it. If you zoom into these unit cells, what you will see is that there are these triangular units, which are also uh, magnified over here. Each of these little triangles is connected at its hinges at its end. And if you volumetrically expand the structure, there are two stable configurations. The first one is as printed. These are the slits, which the laser cutter cut. And then if you open it up, there's actually a second state, a strained state, which is also stable. It has higher energy because you have elastically strained the system but it is also a stable configuration. So if you open this up and you just put it on a table, that's what you see on the left. If you then hit it, what happens is each of these unit cells wants to go from high energy back to low energy. They want to go from here to here. And so if you excite the system, um, and let's just wait for it to happen. What you will see is, it's not too spectacular, but you'll see that this, oops, uh, sorry, the system essentially, goes from the open state to the closed state in a well-coordinated fashion. You will see that the wave actually travels around the water first and then reaches the interior, which is very classical of phase transformations in solids. And there's a very neat analogy. You can make them not only in 2D, you can also make nice 1D chains, and you have systems that start moving around. 
this structural configuration from open to closed is in a way nothing else but an analog of phase transformations in materials, where you have two stable configurations, and if you apply the right stimulus, it changes from one to another. And so in the first two uh, uh, topics that I talked about, I talked about stiffness and strength and how instead of looking at atoms, we looked at structures. Here we're pretty much doing the same thing. We're looking at not atoms, but structures, but we're again adopting a principle from atoms. In this case, it's the structural transformation. You can do a lot of things with this. I don't have the time to talk about it, but I'm sure you, uh, I'll show you a few pictures of, of applications, mainly from colleagues and friends. I um, already mentioned Katia Bertoli, uh, Chiara de Rayo is another collaborator at Caltech. They're trying to use these systems for robotic locomotion. So if you have many of these systems and you can do left and right design, you can actually have robots that move by actuation. Uh, Chiara, together with Jennifer Lewis at Harvard, they worked at systems which respond to temperature. So you can make these guys, and once they're heated up, they actually transform. You can also make swimmers based on this principle uh, where the thing starts to swim and the temperature changes. Um, you can make adaptive structures. This is just one fun example where we take the ETH logo, we make it out of these, and you know, once you excite it, it can transform from either large to small or can even change shape. And finally, in the bottom left is an example from Jordan Rainey, a collaborator at UPenn, uh, who works on uh, chemically responsive structures. So this is a structure which is stable, but the moment it comes into contact with the right solvent, it starts to do things. And this is of great interest for all kinds of applications from you know, materials in the ocean that prevent oil spill and whatnot. The very last example I want to show is this one. This was again done together with Julia Greer and with Claudio DeLeo and their teams. Uh, it's actually a battery. Um, it, what you see here is a, a truss, uh, but this truss uh, is a lithiated silicon coated polymer. Uh, so imagine you make a polymer lattice and then you coat it with silicon. This more or less behaves as the anode in a battery. If you put this into an electrolyte and you apply electric field, what happens is that this silicon wants to swell. It lithiates and it swells. And for better experts in the audience, you probably know better than me. Um, this is one of the issues in battery design. If you have a material and it lithiates, it wants to undergo a huge volumetric expansion. And the problem is that this is usually leads to failure of batteries. If you make the battery in terms of such a structure, there's plenty of room where it can expand and swell without breaking. And that's exactly what was done here. So these beams are in the ground state, but once you lithiate them, they swell. But instead of breaking, what they can do is they expand and they buckle. And so you can actually use this and you can apply electric fields. And you can see that these structures change upon application of electric fields. You can think of this in two ways. On the one hand, you can think of it as a nice way of making some sort of battery that doesn't really crack upon huge volumetric expansion or swelling. Uh, but you can also think about it in terms of a matter material, because now you actually have a structure which responds to applied electric fields as a stimulus. And so I could keep talking more and more, but at some point I think Rodrigo is going to kill me if I don't stop here. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to conclude quickly. I try to convince you that Mechanical metamaterials offer a really wide range of opportunities for tailoring, for controlling, or changing material properties. I talked about stiffness and strength, but you can also do things in terms of resilience. We work on fracture toughness, damping, wave guiding, elastic wave guiding, multi-stability, I showed a few examples. There are still many challenges exist, both in modeling and in fabrication, but I think there's also a tremendous room for opportunities. Um, speaking of opportunities, all of this would not have been possible uh, without the collaboration uh, with a couple of people at Caltech, at Penn, at Harvard, and uh, of course with my group at previously Caltech, now at ETH. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, past and, and present funding sources. And so with this, I'm at the very end, but of course I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dennis, for this amazing presentation. Now we are going to take some questions from the audience. Si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, puede levantar la mano o escribirla en el chat. You can raise your hand or write your question on the, on the chat. Yeah, we have a question from Joaquín. Joaquín Castro, please. Um, hello, Professor Kochman. Uh, my question is, do you think that uh, topology optimization techniques have potential to create high performance? High performance uh, metamaterials? 
Definitely. Um, we're actually exploiting uh, uh, topology optimization ourselves in collaboration with Ole Sigmund in Denmark. Um, <clears throat> there are different levels of topology optimization of things one can do. Um, for example, you could optimize the unit cell for certain properties. Um, the way we use topology optimization is actually in a two-scale fashion. If you have a certain material and you want it to have different properties on one end as compared to the other, what is the optimal unit cell of your architecture? And then how can you bridge from one to another? We actually use topology optimization for this. So I would definitely say yes. Um, it depends on what scheme of topology optimization is being used. You have to account for fabrication constraints and so forth. But I definitely think uh, there's a lot of potentials for that. And it has already been used. Alguna otra, alguna otra pregunta? Recuerden, pueden levantar la mano, escribirla en el chat y yo hago la pregunta. John Ramos, please. John? I don't hear anything. No, no we can't he uh, hear you. Please, you can write the question on the chat if you want, and I can read it for you. No te escuchamos, John. Si quieres, puedes escribir tu pregunta en el chat. Yo la leo por ti. Aún no te podemos escuchar. We can't hear you still. Another optimization problem. Hello. Hello. <laughs> And my question is, is it possible to implement metamaterials in the construction of house of, or building? I mean, I would say yes and no. Um, technically, of course, in principle, this would be a great way to, to do things. Um, and there has been some work, as far as I know, for example, for um, surface coatings of, of walls and windows and these kind of things, making metamaterial surfaces that have interesting properties for light absorption, refraction, and so, uh, reflection, and so forth. One of the key challenges is that um, for your purposes, you would really need to make very large objects, I guess, and, and not just very small ones. And so if you really want to have small scale features of the type that I was showing, then you're usually limited to making systems which are millimeter or at most centimeter size. I'm not aware of anyone who can print you know, meter-sized objects with micron-sized resolution. This is still a huge bottleneck. Uh, it's, a, it's a topic of scalability, going to large scales. Um, so I would say in principle, yes, but fabrication really is not there yet, that they could make very large objects. I hope that answered your question. Thank you very much. We have another question from Fabian Pirat, a colleague. Um, Do you uh, build metamaterials in Zurich or is more yeah. your research more theoretical? Good question. So we do build them at the larger scales. Um, we do make a lot of polymeric structures. Uh, we work with those. When it comes to nanometer ones, we usually do all the, uh, all the modeling. So for all of the ones that, that, that you saw, it usually works like this, that on the modeling side, we predict what the optimal structure looks like. Then we go to our friends at Caltech and say, can you make those? And then they would try and see, and there's a closed feedback loop between prediction and seeing what they see and so forth. Yeah. Um, when it comes to large scale structures, we do make them ourselves and we test them over here as well. And well, another, other pregunta, una última pregunta, yo creo. Another question, the last one. John? Me. Uh, how do, how do materials behave against combustion? Are they flammable? I would say it depends on the material. Right? So if, if you take the polymeric ones, uh, they're just going to disappear at the moment you put a, a lighter on them. Um, the ceramic ones, though, you can really, uh, some of the, let's see if I can, well, it's, um, if, if you think about the structures, the ones that you could compress, uh, the one that I was showing, there we could actually uh, make them completely uh, out of ceramics. And in this case, these were pure aluminum. 
So there, the properties are very much those of the base material. And if you make them out of ceramics, uh, then I would expect that, yes, they can indeed withstand high temperatures uh, and, and uh, are inert against uh, reactions in, in most combustion. But honestly, we haven't looked at this at all, and I'm not aware that uh, our, our friends at Caltech have. Uh, that's a good question. Okay. Dennis, thank you very much for joining us. It has been a very impressive presentation. We know you are pretty busy, so it has been an honor. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks very much. Ciao. Ciao. Bye.